guys? Welcome to the first episode of Opal Wave MTG. I'm your host, Jacob, and today we're going to be checking out Feather the Redeemed. So, Feather is a 3-mana Boros creature with flying, and whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell that targets a creature you control, exile that card instead of putting it into your graveyard as it resolves. If you do, return it to your hand at the beginning of the next end step. And generally, Feather is played as a Voltron-style commander that utilizes cantripping instants and sorceries to pump Feather up, so you can beat face and draw cards at the same time. Uh, and that's actually how we're going to approach the skirmish version of Feather. And as we move up in the power level scale, uh, we're actually going to be focusing less on the Voltron beat strategy and going for more utility and combo finishes. So uh, if we're going for the Voltron, we give our opponents more time to interact with us since we have to take out each player individually. If we're just going for the combo finishes, opponents have less time to interact because uh, we take them all out at the same time. So we're going to check out our creatures here. We've got a Chrome Crusader, Vanguard of Brimez, and Young Pyromancer as a way to generate tokens and go wide just in case we lose Feather. Our Liege is a way to do some chip damage and lean on Light Scribe, and Zada act as a really nice way to pump our board. Uh, and Zada can just turn our pump spells into overrun effects, essentially. A few ways to ramp, like Loyal Warhound and Solemn Simulacrum. And Storm Kiln Artist is a very strong include in a deck like this, basically making our instants and sorceries free. Moving on to our sorceries, uh, we've got Angel Fire Ignition, which is a really cool card from Midnight Hunt. Put two plus one plus one counters on a target creature. It gains Vigilance, Trample, Lifelink, Indestructible, and Haste until the end of turn. So, Keyword Soup, and the creature that you target gets uh, uh, permanently bigger by putting the two plus one plus one counters on it. So, a really strong card here. Another cool synergy you get is with the Flashback ability. So, as this spell resolves, you either choose to exile it with Feather's ability or with the Flashback ability. So, you choose... Uh, Feather's ability sends it to exile and then it returns it to your hand at the beginning of the next end step. So if you lose this card for some reason, someone wheels it away, or uh, you just don't have access to it anymore, it's a really cool way to get it back from your graveyard. Emery's Call and Shatter Skull Smashing are just free real estate in a deck like this. Uh, lands that can enter untapped, and Shatter Skull Smashing has the uh, extra utility. Uh, you can target one of your own creatures. With one of the as one of the targets, and then target the other thing that you actually want to remove, and then Shatter Skull Smashing will come back to your hand because of Feather's ability. It's a really nice utility uh, with both of these cards. Gird for battle and kick in the door. Just ways to make Feather permanently bigger by giving them plus one plus one counters. And kick in the door also ventures into the dungeon, so you can get uh, just a minor utility there, whether it's drawing a card or making treasure tokens. Um, and then launch the fleet as another way for us to attempt to go wide. Start small at first, but over, over the course of a game, this can really start adding up. And Zada also uh, basically pays for the strive cost, so really cool interaction there. Moving on to our incense, this is going to be our meat and potatoes um, in a deck like this. So just a, a, few, a few removal spells like a braid, chaos warp. Path of Exile, the usual suspects, source, uh, source of Plowshares. Some really cool options um, are Light of Hope and Raise the Effigy. Very flexible cards. Uh, so Raise the Effigy, Destroy Target Artifact, or you could pop up Feather uh, by plus two plus two. Light of Hope, you can destroy an enchantment or put a plus one plus one counter on Feather or another creature if you really want to. So you continue to pop Feather and then when you need to destroy something, choose that other mode. So really cool flexibility with those two cards. Um, <clears throat> then we've got a few of our finishers like Balduvian Rage, Fist of Flame, and Show of Confidence from Strixhaven. Um, essentially has Storm for each instance of sorcery that's cast before it, um, and then puts permanent plus one plus one counters, and uh, also gives the creature Vigilance. So uh, really cool uh, finisher in a deck like this. Couple ways to give our creatures double strike like Boros Charm, uh, Timber Battle Rage, um, Psychotic Fury also draws us a card. Soul's Fire is a cool way with Feather that we can uh, deal some direct damage. So in case we're swinging at one person and someone else is a board that we can't get through, Soul's Fire, boom, just straight damage. 
Uh, unfortunately, Soul's Fire does not interact with Zada because Zada needs it to uh, specifically target only Zada. So Soul's Fire requires two targets. So unfortunately, that interaction does not work that way. Moving on to our artifacts, we've got a mix of two and three mana artifacts just to help keep our ramp going. Just in case Feather gets removed, we'll have ways to, to recast it. We've got Black Blade Reforged, uh, Commander's Plate, Livewire Lash as a way to just do some extra chip damage um, if we have the Feather out, uh, Skull Clamp, uh, Sunforger, and a deck like this, uh, Sunforger just provides uh, a ton of utility. Swift, proof, swift proof foot boots as a way to protect feather. Um, lightning greaves give shroud, so a little anti synergy going on there. That's why I didn't include it in this version. Uh, Sword of the Animus is a way to slide, you know, just kind of get some ramp as we're as we're doing our beats plan. And then we'll move on to our enchantments. We've got double vision and myth realize. So double vision uh, basically copy the first instant of sorcery spell you cast each turn. Uh, so whether that's copying a big Balduvian Rage or Fist of Flame, um, or even copying some of your removal spells, um, can be really strong. And also, if you're just going for the utility game, you can copy a Crimson Wisp and draw the extra uh, two cards per turn, as opposed to just drawing the one card per turn. Then we've got Myth. The Myth Realized uh, kind of just sits in the back, avoids a lot of creature board wipes, and then um, once it hits. Uh, a couple of counters, like 10, maybe 12, uh, and then someone wipes the board, you just animate it, start swinging at people, it can be a really nice uh, uh, game finisher that kind of just sits in the back and doesn't draw too much attention to itself. Moving on to the lands, uh, we've got 28 lands here, which is uh, admittedly enough a pretty small number, but we actually move up to 33 lands with the MDFCs, which is perfectly acceptable in a deck like this. Uh, especially considering our curve pretty low um, and also our you know, our spells are just generally cheap so uh, it's okay for us to kind of go down to 28 lands with the 33 MDFCs um, we get a lot of utility and we're not going to be drawing as many duds so next up is the battle version of feather and so we'll go ahead and start with the creatures We've got a couple of stacks creatures. They have a mind sensor, are kind of a Myria, trained with Magistrate just to help uh, slow down our opponents. And because we're doing more of a utility thing, not trying to like chain a bunch of instant sorcerers at one time, our kind of a Myria is really great at allowing us to just cast one of our cantripping spells on each of our opponent's turns, getting that incremental value uh, again while slowing down our opponents. Then we've got Dual Caster Mage, uh, just really great utility, but also is. Uh, uh, one of our combo pieces with Ephemerate or Cloud Shift. So essentially you cast Cloud Shift on a creature. In response, you cast your Dual Caster Mage and its ETB will uh, copy either the Cloud Shift or the Ephemerate. And from there, uh, you the new Flicker spell copies your Dual Caster, or not copies it, excuse me, it flickers your Dual Caster Mage. Dual Caster Mage enters the battlefield and you copy your Cloud Shift again creating infinite uh, ETBs. So if you have a Perforos God of the Forge or an Impact Trimmers, uh, this essentially deals infinite damage to the entire table. Then we've got Halvar God of Battle, which seems like uh, kind of an awkward include here. And to be honest, we're not really gonna be using the front side of Halvar. We're gonna be using, oops. We're gonna be using the back side of Halvar. So Sword of the Realms is an equipment and the important part here is whenever equipped creature dies, return it to its owner's hand with equip two. So essentially with a Dockside Extortionist and a Sacrifice Outlet, this allows us to create uh, either infinite ETBs if we have a treasure count of four, or we can create infinite ETBs as well as infinite mana if we have a treasure count of five. So essentially uh, with two mana, you cast your Dockside, ETB, you make, let's say you make four treasures. So you make those four treasures, sacrifice your dock side, uh, or excuse me, uh, use two of those to equip to your Sword of the Realms. From there, you sacrifice your dock side extortionist, which will trigger the ability on Sword of the Realms, returning dock side to your hand. Cast dock side extortionist again for the remaining two treasures that you have. And from there, 
rinse and repeat. Like I said, you can use that with the perforos or an impact trimmers like we'll see later um, to deal that uh, infinite damage to the table. Then we've got Imperial Recruiter and Recruiter of the Guard. Nice ways to tutor. They can pretty much tutor. Between the two of them can find pretty much every creature in our deck outside of uh, Perforos. And Halvar is a 4-4 creature. So neither of them can tutor for that. Kind of makes the combo a little fair since we have to like manually find Halvar. Then we've got Blast Hack as a way to just kind of reset the board in case our opponents are going a little too wide. Uh, again, Miri's Call, Chattergill Skull Smashing are just free real estate in a deck like this. Then we've got Open the Armory as a way to tutor for some of our equipment, and Sabine's Rack is a very powerful reanimation spell uh, that we're going to be using here. Moving on to our instance, like I said before, not so much focused on um, protecting uh, and pumping Feather, and more based on utility. So again, we're keeping our removal suite pretty much, but we've also um, added a little bit more removal just to kind of help us control the board since we are playing a slightly more controly kind of game plan here. Uh, moving on to the artifacts. Uh, the artifacts are a little more streamlined here. Uh, kind of sticking with the two mana artifacts as opposed to the three ones we do have Commander Sphere and Cursed Mirror. Commander Sphere just if you really don't need it, sacrifice it, draw a card, don't really need to invest any more resources into it once you've uh, initially cast it. And then Cursed Mirror is really nice because you can have it enter as a copy of any creature on the battlefield. So even if you don't have one of your uh, ETB creatures like a Dockside or an Imperial Recruiter, you can just copy one of your opponent's creatures. So really nice utility on this rock here. And then uh, we are down to three equipments. We've got Skull Clamp, great way to just, again, card advantage. Sword of Feast and Famine uh, is really nice. Since we're playing more of a controly build, we're going to want our mana to be up more often. And so Sword of Feast and Famine allows us to tap out on our turns and still have mana available on our opponent's turn. And then finally, we've got the Sun Forger. Again, just fantastic way to tutor for a lot of uh, the instants and sorceries in our deck. And then we've got Ashnod's and Phyrexian Altar uh, as sacrifice outlets for the Dockside combo we were talking about earlier. Uh, but it also, if we've got like uh, the Young Pyromancer or the Monastery Mentor out, uh, we can use the creatures that they create to produce more mana for us. <clears throat> Moving on, we've got our enchantments. So Blood Moon, Rule of Laws, ways to, again, slow our opponents down. Land Tax is fantastic in a Feather deck. Uh, since we want to be drawing less lands, this allows us to strip the lands from our deck, lowers the chance of us drawing those lands. Goblin Bombardment and Impact Trimmers are both outlets. Uh, Goblin, Goblin Bombardment has really nice utility outside of the combo with Dockside. Uh, again, if we have one of our uh, creature producers like the Young Pyromancer, Monastery Mentor, we can use those Goblin Bombardment to uh, play the removal game with these, and it can be an outlet, so really nice utility there. Moving on to the lands, uh, we're actually down to 26 lands now. Um, considering our ramp package, as well as our overall curve, uh, we really don't need that many lands. Once we hit four or so, um, we're, we're going to be rocking and rolling, especially with the amount of ramp that we've got going on here. And once we get a dock side out too, um, this, do this deck loves to flicker dock side, um, especially with a feather out. Uh, you get that Cloud Shift, Ephemerate, or Eerie Interlude, and every turn you're flickering that dog side, making a ton of treasures, um, and also just makes it hard for our opponents to interact with us since we can, uh, if you suspect your opponent has removal, you can just simply not cast it. Or if you have the Cloud Shift and Ephemerate, you can cast one, they try to remove it, you cast the second one in response to it. Uh, so yeah, really nice uh, utility going on with these two cards. Before we move on to the glory version of Feather, if you think this content is cool and you want to see more of it, go ahead and like, subscribe, and leave a comment below letting me know what commander you'd like to see me brew next time. So as I was talking about before earlier, as we move up in the power levels, we're going to be focusing less on Feather as a more of a gimmicky thing and moving more towards uh, comboing off and just straight up winning the game. So we're going to move on to our creature section here. We've got, uh, again, we've kind of 
increased the amount of staples that we're using overall. As you move into that CDH meta, it's really expected that we start using a lot of these staples uh, just to make sure that uh, I mean, they're staples for a reason. We gotta be using them if we wanna be playing with the big guys, right? So we've got Holmes Collector is a really cool way to shut off our opponent's wheels. There's a ton of wheels in CDH, as well as just in tandem with our own Wheel of Fortune. Uh, it's got Flash, so if you have both of these cards, you can, at the end of turn, uh, flash your Holmes Collector in, untap, cast your wheel, shut off everyone else's hands, so really cool there. We got Bergy, God of Storytelling, and Foundry Inspector as uh, ways for our Mystic Forge and uh, Sensei's Divining Top combo. Basically, draw through our deck. Dockside is now going to be a combo piece with uh, Magda, Brazen Outlaw. So, basically, Cloudstone, Curio. But these two allow us to, again, tutor for the Mystic Forge Sensei's combo um, and just let us win from there. Then we've got. Uh, Drenith Magistrate again is just a powerhouse in CDH. It stops so much stuff that's that's going on. The the best win cons pretty much outside of a uh, um, Thoracle Consult. Dualcaster Mage is a little bit more straightforward with our combo. So we've added in the Heat Shimmer and the Twin Flame as just essentially two card combos. It works much like the Cloud Shift combo. We're gonna target. We're gonna cast our Heat Shimmer targeting one of our creatures. Hold a priority, cast our dual caster mage. Heat Shimmer is going to make a copy of dual caster mage that has haste. And that token is going to create another heat shimmer. And so essentially you create infinite dual caster mages with haste. And you can just move to combat and swing at the table like that. And you don't necessarily need uh <clears throat> you don't necessarily need that outlet uh, like we did in the previous version. We've got Simeon Spirit Guide as a way for us to just generate faster mana. Oswald, Goblin Engineer, and Goblin Motor led us to shenanigans with all the artifacts that we've got going on in our deck. And uh, Skyclave Apparition is fantastic removal and also gives us just a little bit of uh, uh, utility with Feather if we happen to have uh, like our Heat Shimmer Twin Flame but we don't have the uh, Toolcaster Mage. We can uh, copy our Skyclave Apparition, or we can just Cloud Shift it if, or Ephemerate it if we really want to, and uh, basically just start exiling all of our opponent's non-land permanents, getting rid of those. Uh, Sarah's Ascendant is a way to just beat down the Adnaz decks, make sure that they have as little life as possible before they cast that Adnaz. It's super, super important that we're hitting those players. Then we'll move on to the sorceries. Again, we've got the Amiri's Call and the Shadow Skull Smashing. These cards are, again, they're just free real estate. Gamble is an extra tutor. Grape Shot is a really cool win con in the deck. Um, should be noted that the original Grape Shot can target a creature. If you have Feather Out, that Grape Shot will go into exile and back into your hand. So you can use the Grape Shot over and over and over again. Uh, and then the uh, extra copies you can just spread out however you want to. So some cool synergy with Grape Shot and Feather going on there. Just as well, fantastic ramp. Savine's Wreck again, great way for us to recur pretty much anything we need. Moving on to our instants. So as you can see, this is the smallest instant package that we have out of all of them. Just because we need to make more room for our win cons. Um, since in a deck where you don't have a ton of tutors for your win cons, you kind of have to just add layering to your win cons uh, so in order to do that layering we kind of have to reduce the overall instant sorcery package that we're doing here uh, so again we've got a braid disenchant some flexible removal spells unexpectedly abs and it's really nice uh, pyroblast red blast are pretty crucial in cdh um, most of the decks are running all of the free counter spells so or even just being able to hit a turn one fish or a rhystic study is always really nice uh, silence, fantastic way to stop our opponents from either winning the game or stop opponents from stopping us from winning the game. Angel's Grace, one of our better ways to stop the uh, Thoracal console lines. <clears throat> and Lightning Bolt uh, is just, it hits so many creatures in the format and can also surprise those really, really greedy Adnaz players. If they, you, you'll often see them go down to two, three. Uh, life off of an Adnaz, depending on what their overall CMC is. 
Moving on to our artifacts. So we've kept some of our two mana artifacts, but we've added in, uh, again, the staples. We've got basically all the free ramp. Uh, Mox Amber, Mox Opal are uh, part of our grinding station combo with Underworld Breach. So essentially, uh, tap your, one of your Mox for mana, and then you sacrifice it with Grinding Station to mill yourself for three. Then from there, you use the three cards that you milled to cast your uh, your Opal again, or your Mox Amber, with uh, the Underworld Breach by exiling the three cards that you milled. And you essentially do that over and over and over again, and you keep producing mana until you find one of your combos, whether that be the Mystic Forge Sensei's top, um, you can do the Dual Caster Lines, um, or you can just find your Aetherflex Reservoir and continue to cast spells until you can take out all of your opponents. Again, we've got the Cloudstone Curio for the Dockside combo. And Uma's Awas Jite is going to be the only uh, equipment in the deck. It's a great way for us to kind of control the board and also get some surprise wins by beating face with Feather. Then we move on to our enchantments, and we've got here a Blood Moon to uh, really cripple the four and five color decks. Even some of the three color decks um, get pretty greedy with their mana bases, running a low amount of basics. So Blood Moon hits really hard. And then we've got the Honorable Breach. Um, again, it's in a pinch, it's really nice um, for uh, just kind of recurring things if you really need to, but is also just a combo piece with the grinding station, and you can also do some fun loops with Jessica's Will and Wheel of Fortune if you want to get really spicy. Moving on to our lands. Um, so all of our lands are pretty much entering untapped, outside of like maybe Inspiring Vantage if you've got uh, uh, an excess of lands going on. Uh, but again, we're, we're in Feather especially, we want to be drawing the least amount of land as possible, and this is true for, especially true for CEDH. The more stuff you can draw, the better. Uh, lands, I want to draw the least amount of lands as possible. And again, these MD, MDFCs allows, gives us that flexibility. Uh, we can either play them as lands, or we can use them as spells. So that's going to be the uh, end of our deck tech here. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the content and uh, looking forward to the next video I do.